going on, everyone? My name is Jamon McKinney, or you can just call me Juice because that is my nickname. Welcome, everyone, to the Juice Alert, episode number 20. If you have not subscribed to the Juice Alert already, be sure to do that right about now. You will not regret it. You can find me on YouTube as well as podcasting platforms. Also, if you're watching on YouTube right now, be sure to smash that like button right about now. It definitely helps out your boy right here, okay? You can also follow me on social media if you want to troll me on Twitter or connect with me on a very good high note. I love to connect with you guys on Twitter and Instagram. You can find my main Twitter account at G-H-I-M-A-N-M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y on Twitter. You can find the Juice Alerts Twitter account you know, on Twitter as well, you know, at the Juice Alert. You can also find me on Instagram at G H I M A N underscore M C K I N N E Y. That's my main Instagram. And the Instagram account for the Juice Alert show is the Juice Alert underscore. A lot of stuff to talk about on this show right here. This is, kind of, this is actually going to be a little bit of a shorter episode to a certain degree. I, I actually had a lot of topics laid out that I want to talk about, but. There were so many of them that I'm going to spread them out. I'm going to spread out these topics throughout the week. So today, we'll just talk about Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, the Titans, the Steelers. We'll have a hard conversation about Drew Brees. The Saints fans are not going to want not that the Saints fans are not going to want to hear. We'll talk about the Raiders. And at the end of the show, we'll talk about the World Series as well. You know, it was a very good game number four versus the Tampa Bay Rays. And the Los Angeles Dodgers last night. That was a phenomenal game. Baseball is officially back to being super duper entertaining. And I'm all for it, man. But I want to address Antonio Brown and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So Antonio Brown signed a one-year deal to join Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And boy, oh boy, I love what Tampa Bay is doing as a football team. Their organization gets it. When you can go all in to win a Super Bowl, you flat out go out and do it. That's why I've been so critical of the Green Bay Packers the last couple of years because they've had a generational talent in Aaron Rodgers at quarterback, and they have been reluctant to spend money. They've been reluctant to spend money in free agency. They don't make trades. They don't take risks. They just say, eh, we'll draft players. No, Tampa actually goes out and gets things done. I like the way the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are operating at this moment. So, Antonio Brown. What does he mean to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as we speak today? Well, with the addition of Antonio Brown, former All-Pro wide receiver, to me, still he's still arguably one of the best wide receivers in the entire NFL if he's relatively healthy. You know, Antonio Brown, when he was last seen, he was the best wide receiver in all football, arguably. It was either him or Julio Jones. Him or, him or Julio Jones were bowing out for who was the best wide receiver in all football. In 2017, Antonio Brown led the NFL in receiving yards despite missing two games. In 2018, he led the NFL in touchdown catches. And as far as I speak today, I can't find very many wide receivers that I would choose to start my football team with over Antonio Brown. Now, now, Antonio Brown has been out of the game of football for a little while, but Antonio Brown, we know about his track record. You know, we can talk about Antonio Brown being a diva all we want. The one thing we know about Antonio Brown is when he's on that football field, he's a special player. So he's a top five wide receiver as far as I'm concerned until proven otherwise. So Tampa, they just added arguably a top five wide receiver in the game right now. And you already have Mike Evans, who's who's definitely a top 10 wide receiver. Chris Godwin's great. Scotty Miller's been playing well. Not to mention you have Cameron Bright and, and Rob Gronkowski at tight end already. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers already were one of the three most talented teams in football on offense when it comes to their skill position players. Now, in my opinion, I'm sorry, Kansas City, but when I look at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense on paper, That's the best offense on paper as far as the skilled position players, okay? Now, you can debate between quarterback, you know, and running back and things of that nature, and maybe Kansas City gets the edge, but as far as the wide receiver core, oh, Tom Brady, he has got weapons galore. He's got weapons for days, man, and that's a big reason why Tom Brady left the Patriots. You know, we look at Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick didn't even attempt to trade for a guy like Le'Veon Bell. I know he's a running back, but he's definitely a good, viable option at wide receiver out of the backfield. He didn't even try to acquire Le'Veon Bell for Cam Newton. For whatever reason, Bill Belichick, 
refuses to address the wide receiver position in New England. Meanwhile, Tampa Bay, they're the opposite. They say, hey, Tom Brady, we know you got Mike Evans. We know you got Scotty Miller. We know you got all these great weapons. Guess what? We'll give you Antonio Brown, another toy to play with. So Tampa Bay, as we speak today, they have an A-plus wide receiver and tight end core, if you combine the two groups, okay? Now, the move that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers made to acquire Antonio Brown will be a move that does one of two things. I don't think there's really any in-the-middle situation in regards to this move for Antonio Brown. Either this move is the move that we are going to look back on and say, this won Tampa Bay Super Bowl 55, or we're going to look back on this move and we're going to say, this blew up the chemistry of the team and it's potentially the reason why Tampa Bay flopped in 2020. Here's the thing you have to understand about Antonio Brown and this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. Tampa Bay did not need Antonio Brown to go out there and win a Super Bowl. That's just my opinion. I felt that they were talented enough to win the Super Bowl before Antonio Brown got there, and they were actually my Super Bowl pick during the preseason, okay? I picked them to win Super Bowl 55. So here's the thing, man. Tom Brady is going to throw the football to whoever is open. And Antonio Brown, he's used to being force-fed the football when he was in Pittsburgh with Big Ben Rousberger. Ben Rousberger would give Antonio Brown 12 to 15 targets a game sometimes. Sometimes Ben Rousberger would target Antonio Brown 20 times a game. It was ridiculous. And while it's there's reason to target Antonio Brown a bunch of times, just because he's a very talented wide receiver, Tom Brady is not like Ben Rousberger. Tom Brady, he's going to throw to whoever is open. He's going to make the game-winning plays. And sometimes that might bother Antonio Brown. You know, Antonio Brown, he's the same guy that was mad at Juju Smith-Schuster for getting team MVP over him, even though Antonio Brown led the NFL touchdown catches that same season. So Antonio Brown has shown that at times he can be a little selfish. He can be a little aloof, okay? You know? And he's the same guy that melted down with the, with the Raiders when John Gruden and Mike Mayock showed him nothing but love. He's the same wide receiver that couldn't last a full month with the New England Patriots, arguably the most stable organization in the entire NFL outside of Pittsburgh. There are some questions about Antonio Brown, and I could see a scenario where Bruce Arians or Tom Brady feels the need to get Antonio Brown involved in the offense a little bit more than necessary just to keep him happy. But at the same time, if I'm Tampa Bay, here's what I'm doing. I'm making it clear to, to Antonio Brown that, hey, man, listen, we know you're talented. We brought you in, but you're not above the team. We're going to make the plays that are going to win the football game. We're going to run the football with Ronald Jones if we need to because Ronald Jones right now, he's fifth in the NFL in rushing yards. He's fifth in the NFL in rushing yards right now as we speak today at the time of this episode. We're going to run the football if we need to. We're going to throw to Rob Gronkowski if he has a favorable matchup. We're going to throw to Mike Evans if he has the better matchup. So Antonio Brown, he's got to grow up fast with this team because Tom Brady, he's not, he's not going to deal with Antonio Brown's nonsense. And Bruce Arians, he's a guy that has a strong personality. You don't want to clash with Bruce Arians if you're Antonio Brown because he doesn't deal with nonsense. So, you know, this could be a situation in which Antonio Brown comes in and screws up the chemistry of this Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense. But honestly, that might be short-lived just because you can honestly cut Antonio Brown if he's acting a fool and not doing his job. So either way you slice it, I believe it's a win-win situation for Tampa Bay. You keep Antonio Brown away from Green Bay. You keep him away from Seattle. You keep him away from New England or or um, Baltimore if you see them in the Super Bowl. You keep Antonio Brown away from some of these teams that may have wanted Antonio Brown in the first place. And listen, if Antonio Brown gets cut by you guys, I guarantee you Seattle's not going to bring him in. I darn sure know the Ravens are not going to bring Antonio Brown in because they could have signed they could have signed Antonio Brown a long time ago. I mean, Antonio Brown, he's cousins with Marquise Hollywood Brown. It makes all the sense in the world for the Ravens to go out there and sign Antonio Brown. And honestly, to keep it a buck fifty with you guys, the Ravens need Antonio Brown more than the Buccaneers. So again, it's a very interesting move. I'm very interested to see how this plays out in Tampa Bay. If this thing works the way I think it can work, Tampa Bay. 
they're as close to a Super Bowl lock as you can get. Now, I'm not going to officially name them Super Bowl locks just because you still got to go through Russell Wilson. You still got to go through the bad man Aaron Rodgers. I know the Tampa Bay Buccaneers destroyed Green Bay recently, but I think that Aaron Rodgers will have something for that Buccaneers defense the second time around if he sees them in the playoffs. You still might have to beat Kansas City in the Super Bowl. But honestly, guys, like I said earlier, on paper, Tampa Bay has arguably the best roster in the entire NFL with the addition of Antonio Brown. And Antonio Brown will be either the reason the Buccaneers win Super Bowl 55 or he potentially could be the reason they lose out on an opportunity to do something special in 2020. Okay, people, let me move on to Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. So this past Sunday, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, they got absolutely destroyed by Tampa Bay, 38 to 10. You know, the Green Bay Packers were up 10 to nothing after the first quarter. Then Aaron Rodgers proceeded to throw two straight interceptions on back-to-back drives. It gave the Buccaneers life, and the Packers could never get back on track after those two interceptions. And Aaron Rodgers, you know, the bad man he is, he was flat out bad. He was due, due in the Buccaneers game. He was 16 for 35 passing. That's 45% completion percentage. He threw zero touchdowns, and he threw two interceptions along with those zero touchdowns. Not a good look for Aaron Rodgers. He had a pass rating of 35.4, and we're talking about a guy that has the highest pass rating in NFL history as we speak today in Aaron Rodgers. And I understand the offensive line was not particularly blocking very well. The wide receivers did struggle to get open at times. But you have to put this loss mainly on Aaron Rodgers. And honestly, people, I'm holding Aaron Rodgers accountable big time this season. You want to know why? Because I've been a guy that has always given Aaron Rodgers somewhat of the benefit of the doubt. And honestly, it's been for good reason. Because Aaron Rodgers, as far as I'm concerned, he's the most talented thrower of the football in NFL history, in my opinion. And Aaron Rodgers, for most of his career... He's had to deal with a lot of things that have gotten in the way of him trying to win multiple Super Bowls. You know, at times, Green Bay has not spent enough money for agency. They've held on to coaches way too long. It was very clear that Mike McCarthy was holding the Green Bay Packers back for years. They finally got rid of him. The defense has constantly let Aaron Rodgers and the Packers down in the playoffs time and time again. For the most part, throughout Aaron Rodgers' career, outside of Eddie Lacy and and Aaron Jones, he's never had a really good running game. And for what it's worth, when Aaron Rodgers last year goes to an NFC title game and and we recognize that Green Bay might need an extra wide receiver or two to put them over the top, guess what Green Bay does? They draft Aaron Rodgers' replacement, Jordan Love. The same, the, a year after Aaron Rodgers goes to an NFC title game and is one game, one game away from the Super Bowl and playing good football. I, I understand why people give Aaron Rodgers the benefit of the doubt. And I'm actually in that company of people that give him the benefit of the doubt constantly because he deserves it. But this year, that ticket has run out because when I look at Green Bay today, you know, obviously you got Kansas City, you got Tampa Bay, you got Seattle, you got Pittsburgh. Those are some of the best teams in the NFL right now. But in my opinion, from a roster standpoint, Green Bay is right there with those teams. I mean, Green Bay, you know, uh, you can make the argument they're even better than Tennessee and Baltimore. I mean, maybe you could throw in Baltimore or Tennessee, but for my money, Green Bay is arguably a top five team in all football as we speak today. I don't think the Buc- I don't think the Packers are done for or frauds just because they lost to the Buccaneers. I think the Buccaneers really need that game, you know, more than the Packers. And for what it's worth, Tampa's a really good football team. And I tried to tell you guys all offseason, Tampa Bay is legit. No one wanted to listen to me, but now people are realizing how good they are. But Green Bay, they're gonna win about anywhere from eleven to thirteen games. They'll be just fine. And let's be real, Aaron Rodgers, he's just had an off day. And I don't expect Aaron Rodgers to have that bad of a game the rest of the way. And when I look at Green Bay, I talked about how earlier Aaron Rodgers, for the most part during his career, has had head coaches holding him back. And that's been true. Well, guess what? Mike McCarthy is now gone. Matt LaFleur, a very young creative head coach, is now in the building. And Matt LaFleur, he got the Packers to an NFC title game in his first season as the head coach. Roughly about a week ago, I said one of the reasons 
why Green Bay as a passing offense has improved so much and why their offense looks so much better than last year is because Matt LaFleur is one of the best young coaches in the entire NFL. So, Aaron, you got a good young progressive head coach. We talked about Aaron Rodgers having a lack of a run, a lack of a run game. As far as I'm concerned, Aaron Jones has 16 rushing touchdowns last year. As far as I'm concerned, Aaron Jones is having an excellent season. We talked about the Packers, maybe not giving Aaron Rodgers another weapon or two wide receiver in this past draft. I can I can make the argument definitely, but as far as I'm concerned, Devontae Adams is arguably a top five wide receiver in the game of football right now. And if you're that bad man that I know you are, I expect you to make these players look good. I expect you to turn water into wine. When I have a guy like Aaron Rodgers, I expect my wide receiver core to look relatively good because you're going to put the football on the money for these guys. I look at the offensive line. Outside of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers game, the offensive line has been great this season. The offensive line is one of the best offensive lines in the entire NFL. And we can talk about the defense being a question mark from time to time, but I look at some of the players they have on that defense. Jair Alexander, a top 10 defensive back in the entire NFL at the corner position. Adrian Amos, you know, Darnell Savage, good players. Kenny Clark. One of the best defensive tackles in the entire NFL. So Darius Smith and Preston Smith, they had, they had excellent seasons last year. Green Bay's defense is no longer a liability. It may not be the best defense in the world, but it's not a liability on the team. And this is the first time in Aaron Rodgers' career, honestly, since 2014, where I look at the team around him and I say, okay, for the first time, Aaron Rodgers has some real true support. And last year, I gave Aaron Rodgers a semi-pass for, you know, sticking up the joint versus the 49ers in the playoffs just because I felt that Green Bay overachieved last year. I felt Green Bay was about a 10-6 and football team heading into the season last year, but they overachieved last year. They overachieved with a brand-new head coach, and they were lucky to get that far. They were a very good team that overachieved last year. But this year, this is the year where you should put it all together, Aaron Rodgers, this is supposed to be your year. It, you know, you look at Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson in Seattle, I don't think he has as good of a roster as you, Aaron Rodgers. You look at Tom Brady. Tom Brady, he's learning a whole new system this year. He's no longer with the Patriots. Tom Brady is doing something completely new that he's never done in his career. Aaron, you should have the upper hand. Aaron, you gave away that game versus Tom Brady. Aaron, you got outplayed by Tom Brady last week. Aaron Rodgers. You got to step up to the plate now, brother. Slowly but surely, the excuses are running out for Aaron Rodgers. That's just a harsh reality. I love Aaron Rodgers to death. I've said in the past, this guy's a top five quarterback of all time. I still believe that. And I believe Green Bay is going to be just fine this year. They, they have a very good roster. You know, solid wide receivers. You know, Devontae Adams, good run game. You know, good offensive line. Aaron Rodgers is still playing like a top five quarterback. This team is capable of winning a Super Bowl. Aaron Rodgers, you got to step up to the plate and deliver. At some point, we have to stop pointing to the defense as to why Aaron Rodgers is failing. At some point, we have to stop pointing to the coaching staff. So Aaron Rodgers, all I'm saying, man, is this. Listen, for, for a while, the excuses were valid as to why you weren't getting to multiple Super Bowls because you didn't have the rosters to compete with the San Francisco's or the Seattle's of the world. But now, Aaron Rodgers, you've got a real run game. You've got a better head coach. You've got a star wide receiver. You've got a decent offensive line. You're in your second year in the Matt LaFleur system. Aaron Rodgers, you wanted Mike McCarthy fired? Guess what? You got your wish. I expect Aaron Rodgers to deliver a Super Bowl. And by the way, if Aaron Rodgers were to retire with only one Super Bowl on his resume, that's kind of a stain on his legacy. Either way, you slice it. Because in his era, guys like Eli Manning and Ben Roethlisberger, who are not better than Aaron Rodgers, have more Super Bowl rings than him. That's a fair, that's a that's a valid point, people. I mean, at least Peyton Manning got the multiple Super Bowls. At least Russell Wilson's gotten the multiple Super Bowls. And by the way, Peyton Manning did win two Super Bowls. I get that. But the last one, he kind of was carried by a Broncos team that, you know, really was really, really good. You know, Peyton Manning, he was kind of riding the coattails. But at least Peyton Manning got the four Super Bowls. Aaron, you haven't been back to a Super Bowl since 2010. Since 2011, 2010, you haven't been back to a Super Bowl. What's going on, brother? You got to step up to the plate. Joe Flacco's won one Super Bowl. 
Nick Foles has won, won Super Bowl. If you're the greatest thrower of the football of all time, and arguably, in my opinion, Aaron Rodgers is that guy, I expect you to get more than one Super Bowl before your time is up. So in the end, Aaron Rodgers, you got to step up to the plate, and, sh- and slowly but surely, Aaron Rodgers' excuses as to why he has only won one Super Bowl, they're slowly running out. That's just the harsh reality. Okay, people, I want to talk about Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers in this segment. So, I'm going to say something right now that a lot of people are not going to like to hear, but I've always had the firm belief that Aaron Rodgers has been a better quarterback than Tom Brady. I've always felt that. Once Aaron Rodgers started entering his prime in 2011, at no point when looking at Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers side by side, have I felt to myself, man, Tom Brady is that much better than Aaron Rodgers. I've never felt that way. I just haven't. And I've always said that Tom Brady is the GOAT. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. You know, I recently did my top five quarterback list. You know, I didn't really make a whole video about it, but I, re- I mentioned it in a recent, you know, segment. I said that Tom Brady, Joe Montana, you know, Peyton Manning, John Elway, and Aaron Rodgers are the top five quarterbacks of all time as we speak today in October of 2020. And now Tom Brady is in Tampa Bay with the Buccaneers. Okay, so I will say this. Tom Brady has a chance to really add to his legacy this year. You know, he's already got a lofty legacy, but if Tom Brady were to win a Super Bowl with the Buccaneers, that would silence a lot of critics because for a long time, he's had Bill Belichick by his side. Something Aaron Rodgers has not had the benefit of having. You know, I felt that for a long time, Mike McCarthy was actually holding Aaron Rodgers back. And by the way, based on what Mike McCarthy, you know, is putting out there in Dallas, it looks like that's that's the honest truth. That really is, okay? And as we speak today in October of 2020, let's keep in mind that for Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady's career, when we, when we compare it side by side, Aaron Rodgers is 11th all-time in completion percentage in the regular season. Tom Brady is 16th. Aaron Rodgers, first all-time in career pass rating in the regular season. Tom Brady is 6th. Aaron Rodgers, number one all-time in touchdown and interception ratio. Tom Brady third. Aaron Rodgers averages 2.1 touchdown passes per game. Tom Brady, 1.9 touchdown passes per game. Hmm. The statistics show that Aaron Rodgers is a better quarterback than Tom Brady. I know that stats aren't everything, but they're records of events that happen. And the record shows that statistically, Aaron Rodgers has been better than Tom Brady in the regular season. Just saying, people. But see, I've always felt that Tom Brady was the greatest and most accomplished quarterback of all time. But I've always said Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback of all time. What does that mean? That means if I could choose one quarterback to start my franchise with from scratch, if I don't, if I can't, if I don't know if I'm guaranteed to get a Bill Belichick, if I'm not guaranteed to get a great offensive line, if I'm not guaranteed to get a number one wide receiver, if I'm guaranteed my defense is going to be doo-doo for a long time, I want Aaron Rodgers leading that squad. And Aaron Rodgers, can we all just admit, he's just flat out more talented than Tom Brady. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, in my opinion, has 1,000% mastered the quarterback position. And Tom Brady has definitely mastered the quarterback position in his own right. The only problem is he's not as talented as one Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers, when we, when we talk about arm strength, throwing out platform, throwing on the run, throwing with touch, deep ball accuracy, the amount of throws that Aaron Rodgers has in his arsenal, some of those throws Tom Brady just flat out does not have. I guarantee you, if you were to look up Tom Brady's best throws on YouTube compared to Aaron Rodgers' best throws on YouTube, just from an eye test perspective, Aaron Rodgers' throws are 10 times more impressive. Should I even bring up the rushing statistics? Because as far as I'm concerned, Tom Brady can barely run for five yards. Aaron Rodgers, we seem to be able to run for 20 to 25 yards from time to time down the field. Aaron Rodgers is a better athlete than Tom Brady. And Aaron Rodgers makes throws in a game that Tom Brady simply cannot even make in practice, people. He's more talented. And I know what you people are going to say. Tom Brady's got six Super Rings. 
What are you talking about? You're a buffoon. You're dumb. You don't know what you're talking about. But I've always felt that players are not defined by rings, especially in football. Teams and coaching staffs and organizations are defined by rings. Because when you're a quarterback, you depend on so many other guys to make you look good and to help you win football games. And for what it's worth, Tom Brady won his first three Super Bowls being a game-managing quarterback. I know that's hard for some Patriots fans to swallow, but that's the honest truth. Tom Brady was not a top-five quarterback at any point when he won his first three Super Bowls. Now, one, what, now, when Tom Brady started going off in 2007, we said that guy's different, okay? Even though he did choke to Eli Manning in the Super Bowl, we still recognize that, hey, Tom Brady's great. But for what it's worth, in the playoffs for their career, Who's got the very completion percentage between Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady? Oh, it's Aaron Rodgers. Who's got the better passer rating in the playoffs for their career? Oh, it's Aaron Rodgers. 100 to 89.8. Almost 11 points higher is Aaron Rodgers' passer rating than Tom Brady in the playoffs. Hmm, interesting. Who's got the better touchdown to interception ratio? It's Aaron Rodgers. What's the difference between Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers? In my opinion, I'll say Tom Brady's a little bit more clutch than Aaron Rodgers, definitely. But the thing about Tom Brady is he's played on significantly better rosters and has had much better coaching staffs. And here's a fun fact that really puts the nail in the coffin as to why I feel Aaron Rodgers is just flat out better than Tom Brady. Here's a fun fact. Aaron Rodgers in 18 career playoff games, has never failed to score 20 points in the playoffs. Tom Brady won a Super Bowl versus the L.A. Rams by a score of 13-3. to And by the way, he didn't get MVP in that game. Julian Edelman got MVP in that game, even though apparently Tom Brady is just throwing to nobody but bums and slot receivers off the street. That's what I've been told. I don't think so, people. Here's another fun fact that supports my argument. During Tom Brady's entire career, during the playoffs, when he has scored less than 25 points in a game on offense, guess what? He has a winning record. 12 wins and 9 losses. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that disproves your argument because Tom Brady finds a way to win games when he plays badly. Maybe you can say that, but I'd argue that proves my point because if Aaron Rodgers fails to score 20 points in a playoff game, his team virtually loses almost every single time. In fact, three of those 12 wins that Tom Brady got when he did not score 25 or more points in a playoff game, three of those wins were in Super Bowls. What does this tell you, people? It tells me personally that Tom Brady is on a roster that doesn't solely rely upon his greatness. Bill Belichick has stolen games from opposing teams when Tom Brady has played poorly due to running the football effectively, due to his defense creating turnovers. And for what it's worth, Bill Belichick and the Patriots at times they cheated from time to time. That's just the harsh reality that some Patriots fans don't want to admit, but the Patriots, they've been accused for cheating in the past. I got to hold that argument against you guys right there, okay? And by the way, Aaron Rodgers has eight career playoff losses, okay? In those eight career playoff losses, his team has given up 36.4 points per game. And here's a fun fact, people. Tom Brady, in 41 career playoff games, has had his defense only give up 30 points Five times. Keep that in mind, people. Only five times in 41 games that Tom Brady has started in the playoffs has Bill Belichick's defense given up 30 points or more. That's astonishing. And by the way, Tom Brady, his record in those games is two and three, people. And meanwhile, you got Aaron Rodgers in his eight career playoff losses. His defense gives up 36.4 points per game. By the way, Aaron Rodgers, for his playoff career, when his defense allows 25 points or less, he's 9-1. I wonder why Aaron Rodgers 
doesn't have more Super Bowls on his resume. And by the way, Tom Brady, he set a record for passing yards in a Super Bowl. He threw for the most passing yards in Super Bowl history versus the Philadelphia Eagles a couple years ago. But guess what? He lost. You want to know why he lost? He lost because his defense gave up 41 points to Nick Foles and Tom Brady, as great as he was, he could not overcome his defense's shortcomings. In fact, Tom Brady, he fumbled when it mattered most. I'm just saying, people, how many times have we seen Tom Brady play poorly and Bill Belichick steal games because the Patriots run the football effectively, because the Patriots defense bails him out with turnovers? In fact, I'm sure you all remember the Atlanta Falcons Super Bowl. Guess what? In the second half of that game, Matt Ryan and the Falcons, their offense was virtually shut down. Outside of scoring one touchdown in the second half, Bill Belichick shut that offense down. People give Tom Brady credit for that comeback, but guess what? A comeback doesn't happen if the other team keeps scoring. So Bill Belichick, he allowed Tom Brady to be clutch. Imagine if if, if Aaron Rodgers' defenses, you know, kind of, you know, held the, the opposing team in check for a little while and allow Aaron Rodgers to get hot until the fourth quarter, and then they say, okay, Aaron, it's a one-possession game. You need to deliver for us right right here, right now. I guarantee you Aaron Rodgers more times than not could come through for his team. But sometimes that's not the case because, well, the game's over at halftime, just like it was versus the 49ers this past year, just like it was versus the Falcons a couple years ago. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. Some of these games for Green Bay have been over at halftime because Aaron Rodgers' defense can't stop a nosebleed, and he has to virtually play perfect for the Packers to even be in these games. Not the case with Tom Brady. And like I mentioned earlier, we've seen Tom Brady win a Super Bowl, scoring only 13 points in, in that game versus the Rams. Bill Belichick shut down the number one ranked Los Angeles Rams offense. Jared Goff was playing great. Tyre Gurley was looking like a star, but Bill Belichick and that defense, along with Brian Flores, they shut the Rams down and they bailed Tom Brady out because Tom Brady in that Super Bowl was not very good. I don't care what any of you Patriots fans say, Tom Brady played poorly and there's no evidence put forward that can convince me otherwise. And by the way, people, we'll never know if this is the case, but I guarantee you that if Tom Brady doesn't have Bill Belichick by his side, the greatest coach of all time, Bill Belichick. Tom Brady is no better than Drew Brees, who's got one ring. He's no better than Aaron Rodgers. He's no better than Peyton Manning. Because Tom Brady, he might get a ring or two because he's great. You know, he's a Hall of Famer for a reason. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. He's super clutch. But ultimately, in the times in which Tom Brady has played poorly, he's had a really good coaching staff and a really good roster around him to bail him out. And Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, and specifically Aaron Rodgers, they have not had that luxury. So all I'm trying to say, people, is listen. Tom Brady can be the GOAT, but Aaron Rodgers, you better appreciate him. And honestly, I don't care what anyone says. There's not a more talented quarterback I've ever, I've ever laid my eyes on other than Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers, he's that guy. It's not Patrick Mahomes. It's not Dan Marino. It's not Brett Favre. It's Aaron Rodgers. He's the most talented and most get to throw of the football of all time. And his stats in the playoffs have been better than Tom Brady in completion percentage, in pass rating, in touchdown interception ratio. He's had a better completion percentage in the regular season. He's had a better pass rating in the regular season than Tom Brady. He's got a better touchdown interception ratio in the regular season than Tom Brady. He averages more touchdowns per game than Tom Brady. Statistically, He's been better than Tom Brady. The eye test shows clearly he's been better than Tom Brady. Unfortunately, the results don't show it because Aaron Rodgers, he's had coaching staffs that's held him back. He's had an organization that doesn't attract free agents. He's had an organization that doesn't have an owner. And he's overall not had the support around him that Tom Brady has had to win multiple Super Bowls. And that's the harsh reality for Aaron Rodgers, you know. But I'm going to tell my truth. And the honest truth for me is that Aaron Rodgers has always been a better quarterback than Tom Brady. Let me talk about the Las Vegas Raiders. I believe the Las Vegas Raiders, led by John Gruden, are definitely on the rise. The future is bright with John Gruden leading the charge for the Las Vegas Raiders. In the offseason, 
I, I did my 2020 season predictions for for NFL teams. I had the Raiders only winning about four games. I said the Raiders would be about a 4-12 and football team. Didn't quite believe in their defense. I felt Derek Carr was a little bit overrated as a quarterback. Maybe not overrated, but I wasn't completely sold on Derek Carr. He's not really overrated, you know, because people don't rate Derek Carr that high in the first place, okay? But I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a big-time believer in Derek Carr. I felt the I just felt other teams in their division were better. You know, I looked at the Chiefs. I looked at the Broncos. I looked at the, I looked at the Chargers roster. I felt all those rosters were better than the Raiders roster. But unfortunately for me, I'm wrong, and I gotta eat that crow. So I totally whipped on the Raiders. They're having a great season, and I'm buying the Raiders stock as we speak today because I truly believe that Derek Carr has found the right offense and the right head coach for him. And you know, during the off season. I said the Raiders had a very good offense on paper outside of Derek Carr just because I wasn't a huge believer in Derek Carr. I recognized that Darren Waller had talent. I recognized that Hunter Renfro was pretty good. I recognized that Henry Ruggs had some potential. I recognized their offensive line was very good. I recognized that Josh Jacobs was very talented. I just did not believe in Derek Carr as a quarterback. But I believe Derek Carr has found the right head coach for him, and he's in the, and he's in an offense that has really good players, and he fits that system. I might have been a little bit too unfair to Derek Carr when evaluating him because when I looked at Derek Carr, I said if I take away Derek Carr's best and worst season, that's kind of what he is. And by the way, if you take away Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady's best and worst season, you're left with greatness. You know, anytime I take away your best and worst season – and I see a bunch of losing records and, you know, very marginal seasons, I kind of think you're a very marginal quarterback. And that's kind of how I felt about Derek Carr. But I think I failed to add context to Derek Carr when evaluating him as a quarterback because John Gruden is by far the best head coach that Derek Carr has ever had. And Derek Carr, He's finally starting to pick up that John Gruden offense, and he's finally starting to execute it at a very, very high level. And by the way, when I look at Tom Brady, Tom Brady had Bill Belichick for his entire career virtually in New England, a Hall of Fame coach. Joe Montana had a Hall of Fame coach throughout his entire career virtually. Aaron Rodgers, he's got a better head coach than Matt LaFleur, and he's playing a lot better this season. We look at Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes has Andy Reid. Russell Wilson has Pete Carroll. Coaching matters in the NFL. And I think that I failed to realize that Derek Carr never found the right head coach for him. He never truly got a decent head coach to work with. But now that John Gruden is in the building, and now that Derek Carr has had three seasons to really soak in the offense, to really learn the system, to know what John Gruden expects of him, and now that he has very good players around him, Derek Carr is playing great. In fact, in the last 21 games, Derek Carr has thrown 32 touchdown passes to nine interceptions as completing 70% of his passes. You know, Derek Carr's first year under John Gruden was a little bit choppy, as expected. Your first year with a new coach, bad roster, you win four games. Last year, the team wins seven games, which is improvement. And now this Raiders team, they're above 500 through, through the first um, seven weeks of the season, and they look like a potential playoff team. I've got to credit the Raiders, man. They've built a very good offense around Derek Carr. Derek Carr has played well. Josh Jacobs is the top 10 running back in the NFL as we speak today. Darren Waller is a beast. They've got very underrated wide receivers. And listen, if the Raiders can beat Tampa Bay this week, and I think it's, I think it's very possible as Tampa Bay is coming off an emotional win versus Green Bay. Now they have to travel all, way, all the way to Vegas. I could see the Raiders potentially pulling off the upset. Will it happen? Maybe, maybe not. We shall see. But win or lose that game, I'm very confident in the Raiders going forward in regards to their future, you know. And listen, the Raiders, they deserve our respect this year because, they, because Derek Carr, he knocked off Drew Brees, and recently he just knocked off Patrick Mahomes. And I have to applaud the Raiders because their plan is working. The Raiders strictly have really dove into trying to find ways to have the best offense possible out there on the field. And it's working. And honestly, it's the right plan. You want to know why it's the right plan? Because the Raiders looked at their division and they said, we can't stop Patrick Mahomes. 
We need to be able to outscore Patrick Mahomes. And guess what? A week a week ago, that's what they were that's what they were able to do. They went to Arrowhead and they beat the Kansas City Chiefs. They outscored the Kansas City Chiefs 40 to 32. They said, "Hey man, we're going to run the football effectively with Josh Jacobs. We're going to be efficient on third down. We're going to give Derek Carr multiple weapons to throw to, and we're going to try to outscore Kansas City and whatever couple of stops we get on defense, hey, it is what it is because Patrick Mahomes, he's just hard to stop." So, man, yeah, I like what the Raiders are doing, you know. They got a very good offensive line. Trent Brown is a very good player. A lot of people criticized the Raiders for signing Trent Brown a couple years ago, saying Trent Brown was overpaid. Very good offensive linemen are hard to find in today's NFL. And to be honest with you guys, I could see the Raiders potentially winning this division as early as next season. I think that they're about a year away from being on Kansas City's level. They may never be on Kansas City's level just because Patrick Mahomes, you know, Andy Reid, they're the cream of the crop of the NFL right now. The Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. But next year, I could see a situation where the Raiders go out there and win the division. I really could, man. You know, I think they need about one more good draft. They need to add a couple more pieces on their defense. And then they're ready to rock and roll. They're ready to be right there with Kansas City for the division. They won't win the division this year because they're not talented enough to win the division. But next year, I could see it happening. And I really admire what Mike Mayock has done in the draft because he's been a great general manager that has drafted very well. You look at Damon Arnett, Jonathan Abram, you know, Henry Ruggs, Hunter Renfro, Tanner Muse, Max Crosby, Cleland Farrell, all these guys that, that Mike Mayock has drafted – they're all playing at a very high level and contributing for, the, for this Las Vegas Raiders team. So the Raiders, you definitely have to pay attention to them, man. A whole new stadium and a whole new era of Raiders football potentially is here upon our eyes. And Derek Carr and John Gruden, they're only getting better. And quite frankly, they're only getting started. The Las Vegas Raiders are getting good very, very fast. And you better not sleep on the Raiders because they might just pass your team by within the next couple of years. Just saying, man, the Raiders are definitely a team to look out for, and they are definitely on the rise, led by John Gruden, as I speak today. Okay, let me talk about the Tennessee Titans. The Tennessee Titans are another team that I kind of whiffed on in the offseason. I felt the Titans would be about an 8-8 football team. They lost a couple of key players in free agency, and really I just wanted to see Ryan Tannehill go out there and put together back-to-back great seasons. And I got to say, Ryan Tannehill has done that, and the Titans, they're proving me, they're, they are proving me wrong. They're not going to finish 8-8. Eight and eight. Barring injury, if this team stays relatively healthy, they're about a 10 or 12 win football team. They'll win anywhere from 10 to 12 games. They really will. They're, they're very good. They're a very talented team, and they're a team that is a legit Super Bowl contender, in my opinion. They're a Super Bowl 55 contender this season. They can go out there and win Super Bowl 55. It is possible. Will it happen? Probably not because there's a lot of good teams out there. You know, you look at the Chiefs, you look at the Steelers, you look at Green Bay, you look at Seattle, you look at Tampa Bay. The Titans are not quite as good as those teams, in my opinion, but Tennessee, they're really, really good. And they easily could win the Super Bowl this year just because last year we saw Tennessee get to the AFC title game. And this year, this version of the Tennessee Titans, are better than last year's, in my opinion. By the way, I got to give a lot of credit to Mike Vrabel. Mike Vrabel is probably the best head coach in the NFL that no one talks about. Everyone talks about Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, even Sean McDermott to a certain degree. People think that he's underrated in Buffalo. He is very underrated, in my opinion. But Mike Vrabel might be a little bit more underrated at the moment. You know, Mike Vrabel, no one brings him up when we talk about the best head coaches in football. And Mike Vrabel, at worst right now, is a very good Tier 2 head coach. And if he gets the Titans to a Super Bowl this year, we might have to start putting putting Mike Vrabel in the Tier 1 category. Because this guy, he's a very good defensive-minded head coach. He gets the most out of his players. And I think the guy knows a thing or two about offense. He's a great motivator. He does sometimes make some, make some questionable decisions. But Mike Vrabel, he's a very good head coach that does not get enough appreciation, wants that trash can, that no good, sorry quarterback, Marcus Mariota, left the building. The Titans, they took off. And you have to give Mike Vrabel a lot of credit because a lot of Titans fans were kind of upset that Marcus Mariota got benched. And, well, 
If it turns out that Mike Vrabel made the right decision because Ryan Tannehill, ever since he inserted him into the starting lineup, my, Ryan Tannehill has taken off as a quarterback. Ryan Tannehill, he's officially arrived, man. He really has. Last year, Ryan Tannehill led the NFL in pass rating. Last year, Ryan Tannehill had 22 touchdowns and six interceptions. And he is picking up right where he left off last season. In fact, in, in the last 15 games, Ryan Tannehill as a starter is 12-3 and three overall as far as the record. So he's winning football games. He's completing 70% of his passes. He's thrown for 35 touchdowns to eight interceptions. And the perception about Ryan Tannehill continues to be, well, he's a game manager. Eh, he's okay. No, no. Ryan Tannehill is playing MVP level football as we speak today. And by the way, Derrick Henry, that dude's a monster. Derrick Henry might be the best running back in all football as we speak today. I know everyone gets enamored with Christian McCaffrey. I know everyone gets enamored with Alvin Kamara and Saquon Barkley. Give me the guy that dominates. Give me a guy that can take the soul of opposing defenses. Give me a guy that just runs over people. Give me a guy that in the playoffs took over the game versus Baltimore. Give me a guy that recently had a had an 84-yard touchdown run versus not an 84-yard touchdown run, a 94-yard touchdown touchdown run. Pardon me. He ran for 94 yards last week versus Tennessee for a touchdown. People say people say that Derrick Henry is not the fastest running back in the world. I disagree. I think Derrick Henry has very underrated speed, and we already we already know he's very hard to tackle. AJ Brown continues to be one of my favorite wide receivers in the entire NFL. I'm so disappointed. My Green Bay Packers did not draft him. I'm very disappointed. Corey Davis is a good wide receiver. John Smith is a good tight end. Adam Humphreys he continues to be a good player. Now, the one thing I will say about Tennessee is they haven't really proven anything yet. They do have to play Pittsburgh this week. I'm very interested to see how they fare versus the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers are a very good team. We'll see how they truly fare versus a really, really good team because so far, the Titans have beaten Denver. They've beaten Jacksonville. They've beaten Minnesota. They've beaten Buffalo, and they've beaten Houston. Out of all of those teams, Buffalo's the best one. And I've not been impressed with the Buffalo Bills. I just have not, okay? So I want to see how the Tennessee Titans fare versus the Steelers. But outside of playing, you know, not great competition, the Titans check a lot of boxes, man. And honestly, I won't be shocked to be seeing the Tennessee Titans playing a team like Kansas City or Pittsburgh in an AFC title game this year because the Tennessee Titans, led by Mike Vrabel, led by Derrick Henry, and led by Ryan Tannehill, who no one wants to give credit to, they're pretty darn good, and everyone needs to keep their eyes on the Tennessee Titans because they definitely are a team that could get to a Super Bowl potentially in 2020. All right, people, let me shift to the next topic. <sighs> this conversation is going to annoy some New Orleans Saints fans, and that's perfectly fine because I get on here to tell the truth. I get on here to tell you what you guys need to hear. I'm not supposed to be the nice guy. I'm supposed to be Dr. Jemaine McKinney that gives you guys the medicine that you need. And I'm sorry, Saints fans, but I got to say it. Drew Brees, as we speak today, in 2020, he's washed. And Drew Brees is no longer a top 10 quarterback. He's just not. Drew Brees is now a tier three quarterback. I've watched the last three playoff games that Drew Brees has played in. And while I see a solid decision maker, I see a guy that can still be efficient. I see a physically limited quarterback at this stage in Drew Brees' career. And by the way, this is not me bashing Drew Brees. Because when I say Drew Brees is washed, you're not, you're not washed if you were never great in the first place. Drew Brees is arguably a top five quarterback of all time. He's a bona fide Hall of Famer, a slam dunk Hall of Famer, first ballot, no doubt about it. But at some point, all players fall off a cliff and all players get old. And Drew Brees, he's just one of those players that has fallen off a little bit and he's gotten old. And in the last three playoff games, Drew Brees has not played particularly well. 
He got lucky versus the Philadelphia Eagles in 2018. If Alshon Jeffrey catches that football, the Eagles probably win the game. He played poorly in the NFC title game versus the Rams, despite probably having a better roster at his disposal, despite playing at home. I don't care about the I don't care about the no call. I don't care about the pass interference, you know, call that went down. You know, I don't care about that. Drew Brees, I saw him in overtime choke away the game to the Los Angeles Rams. And last year in the playoffs was the final straw for me. I saw Drew Brees lose at home, being a heavy favorite. He lost to Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins does not look good this year. And the Vikings, they had no business being that Saints team last year. I said last season, heading into the playoffs, the Saints arguably had the best roster in the entire NFL. And Drew Brees, he played poorly. He let it go to waste. And we've seen when you get pressure on Drew Brees and you take away Michael Thomas and limit Alvin Kamara, the Saints don't go anywhere. They're not a viable football team. Drew Brees does not have a second or third punch at his disposal. He can't fit the ball in the tight windows anymore. He can't run around and make plays like he used to. He's not the same athlete he once was. He never was the greatest athlete, but now he can't move at all hardly. And Drew Brees has gotten old and the game has passed him by. I watched Justin Herbert going against Drew Brees recently on Monday Night Football. Justin Herbert vastly outplayed Drew Brees in that game. Wasn't even close. Drew Brees was not the better quarterback on the field. And honestly, people, if the Saints don't have Taysom Hill on their roster for that Chargers game, they probably lose. Because Drew Brees, he can't run the football in the end zone like Taysom Hill did right there. He just can't do that. He's not the same athlete that Taysom Hill is. And by the way, the Saints should have lost that game because the Chargers just turned into the Chargers down the stretch. They missed the game winning field goal. The rest is history. Drew Brees this season, he's gotten outplayed by Derek Carr. He's gotten outplayed by Aaron Rodgers. Even in the game that he won versus Tampa Bay, he only completed 60% of his passes. And I know a lot of people are going to say, look at the statistics. The statistics show that Drew Brees is still a great quarterback. That's fool's gold. That's wrong. Statistics are overrated, people. Because here's the thing. Last year, the top five leaders in passing yards, all five of them missed the playoffs. Jameis Winston, Dak Prescott, Jared Goff, Phillip Rivers, and Matt Ryan, none of those quarterbacks were in the playoffs last year. If we are referring to statistics, then Daniel Jones might be a better quarterback than Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Matthew Stafford, and Jared Goff. You want to know why I say that? Because according to statistics, which you people say is everything, Daniel Jones had more touchdown passes last year than Kyler Murray, Matthew Stafford, Jared Goff, and Josh Allen. We know that Daniel Jones is not better than any of those quarterbacks. Anyone, anyone with a brain knows that. I, and I like Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones has some talent, but he's not better than those quarterbacks. Tom Brady played in four less games than Daniel Jones last year, and Daniel Jones on a bad Giants team had more touchdown passes than Tom Brady. But Tom Brady is still a better quarterback to this day than Daniel Jones. Statistics once again proven to be overrated. Jameis Winston, second in the NFL last year in touchdown passes. Where'd that get Jameis? Jameis right now is a backup quarterback, backing up the most overrated quarterback in football at the moment, Drew Brees. And yes, I'm saying Drew Brees is an overrated quarterback right now because Saints fans continue to tell me this guy is still great. He's still a top 10 quarterback. When In fact, both those statements are false. He's not great anymore. He's very good, but not great. And he's not a top 10 quarterback. Drew Brees used to be a top 10 quarterback, but that is no longer the case. What people have to understand about Drew Brees is that he plays in a stat-friendly offense. And by the way, he plays with a lot of good players. Michael Thomas, top three wide receiver in all football. Alvin Kamara, top five running back in all football. Sean Payton, he's scheming up open wide receivers. He's one of the best offensive minds in the entire NFL. By the way, this season, Teddy Bridgewater has thrown four touchdown passes to three interceptions on the season. That's what good wide receivers, you know, DJ Moore, you know, Curtis Samuel, Robbie Anderson. It's not like Teddy Bridgewater doesn't have good targets out there. Guess what? In Sean Payton's offense last year, 
Teddy Bridgewater went 5-0. and And Teddy Bridgewater threw nine touchdown passes to two interceptions in those, in those games. And by the way, Drew Brees' numbers are being inflated by screen passes. I was watching the Green Bay Packers play the New Orleans Saints you know, a couple weeks ago, I saw Alvin Kamara catch a three-yard pass that went for 65 yards for a touchdown. And Drew Brees did nothing but th- throw a three-yard pass. Alvin Kamara did all the work, and Drew Brees' stats get rewarded because Alvin Kamara did the work for him. Alvin Kamara has bailed Drew Brees out time in and time out. And I'm not knocking Drew Brees for utilizing Alvin Kamara. I'm just saying, don't give me that Drew Brees' statistics are so good when, in reality, they're being inflated by him not doing any real work to get those statistics. There's always a story behind the numbers. Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, those guys are throwing the football in the tight windows down the field. Drew Brees, he's dinking and dunking, throwing a bunch of short passes, and hitting, and hitting open wide receivers. I'm not impressed. A lot of quarterbacks could do that. Ryan Fitzpatrick, I'm convinced, can come into the Saints offense and look pretty good. And Drew Brees, he doesn't push the football down the field anymore. The Saints do not consistently push the football down the field because Drew Brees has a limited arm. Either Drew Brees consistently refuses to push the football down the field or either he can't do it. I'm going to guess that Drew Brees just flat out can't do it because five years ago, no one was talking about Drew Brees' lack of arm strength. Now they are. And there's reasons why they are saying he has a lack of arm strength. It's because it's true, people. Drew Brees, at this stage in his career, has a very average arm. He doesn't like to push the football down the field. He can't avoid a sack. He is strictly a system quarterback. And if you put Drew Brees on another team with the average roster, like the Dolphins, he's not putting up these these numbers that he's putting up right now. Okay, he's just not. He's not. And honestly, I look at some of these quarterbacks. I take Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson. Ben Roethlisberger, maybe Ryan Tannehill, based on the way he's playing as of late. Ryan Tannehill's playing at a high level. He's making throws down the field that Drew Brees can't make. Derek Carr's playing better than Drew Brees this year. I might rather have Derek Carr with Drew Brees today. Kyler Murray's playing better. I potentially would take Dak Prescott over Drew Brees. I mean, Dak Prescott, he did throw for nearly 5,000 yards last year. He's throwing the football down the field. I mean, Drew Brees. He's not making some of the throws that Dak Prescott is making. Dak Prescott's a better athlete. Dak Prescott's younger. And honestly, to keep it a buck fifty with you, the playoff success is pretty is pretty identical the last three seasons, just because both only have one playoff win in the last three years. Carson Wentz to me is better than Drew Brees right now. I'd rather have Joe Burrow right now, probably than Drew Brees. I'd rather have Jared Goff probably rather than Drew Brees right now. I'd probably rather have Matthew Stafford too because Matthew Stafford has one of the five best arms in the NFL. He's just being wasted by the Lions once again. So I just counted off. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That's 16 quarterbacks I said I would definitively take over Drew Brees or maybe take over Drew Brees. I would maybe take Tannehill. I would maybe take Carr. I would maybe take Dak. I would maybe take Burrow. I would maybe take Jared Goff. The other guys, 100% I'm taking over Drew Brees right now. Because Drew Brees, he's just not the same guy. He's a tier three quarterback right now. He's not pushing the football down the field. He's physically limited. And he's not the same guy he used to be. Drew Brees is washed. Drew Brees is overrated. And Drew Brees is no longer a top 10 quarterback as we speak today. In 2020. Okay, let me talk about the Carolina Panthers right about now. The Carolina Panthers have been a pleasant surprise in 2020, dare I say. This is a team that I picked to go 3-13 and during the 2020 NFL offseason. And I felt the Panthers, you know, they lost a lot of talent on defense. I didn't think the offensive line was all that great. I felt the Panthers would be relying on their young players way too much. I just felt that having an entire new coaching staff in an offseason where there's been a lot of where there were a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of players did not get op- get opportunities to play in preseason games. Actually no players got opportunities because there was no preseason games. And for what it's worth, I felt that Atlanta, New Orleans, and Tampa Bay were just far more talented teams. I felt Carolina could not keep up with within, within their division. 
I was wrong. The Carolina Panthers are 3-3 three and three through six games. And by the way, I'm not going to rule out the Panthers potentially beating the Saints this week just because the Saints, they're without Michael Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. That could be trouble for Drew Brees and that offense. So I won't be shocked if Carolina beats the Saints this week. But I want to really focus in on head coach Matt Rule. Because while I did pick the Panthers to be a bad football team this year, that did not mean I did not believe in Matt Rule. I've been a Matt Rule supporter from day number one. I have. I've, I've supported Matt Rule wholeheartedly since he's entered the NFL. I felt he was an excellent hire for the Carolina Panthers, and he's proving me, he is proving me right so far. The thing that I loved most about Matt Rule is the fact that he turns around programs and he does it very quickly. We saw him at Temple. In his first season there, he went 2-10. and 10. But in his third and fourth season, Temple won, won double-digit games. They, they had back-to-back 10-win 10 10 win seasons, and they reached bowl games. At Baylor, his first year there, the team was 1-11 and 11 his first year there. His final year there, they go 11-3 and three and get to a bowl game versus Georgia. I have all the confidence in Matt Rule as a head coach, and I believe Matt Rule is more than capable of turning the Carolina Panthers into a Super Bowl contending team down the road. Matt Rule gets the most out of his players. He brings a certain energy that I love. Players seem to respect him. He seems to be a player's head coach. He's not afraid to be aggressive. And I love the fact that he brought in Joe Brady. Joe Brady has been a great addition to the team as offensive coordinator. We saw what he did with Joe Burrow at LSU last year. And Matt Rule did something very interesting. He picked all defensive players in the 2020 NFL Draft. Not a single offensive player was selected by the Panthers during the 2020 Draft. And keep in mind, it was a it was a draft full of a bunch of good wide receivers and good offensive players. But instead, Matt Rule chose to go all in on defense. And some of those picks have definitely panned out, man. You look at Derrick Brown, Uter Gross Models, and Troy Pride. They're all playing at a very high level as rookies. But Jeremy Chin might have been the Carolina Panthers' best pick this past in, in this past draft. Jeremy Chin has been so good for this Panthers defense. He, he's let he leads the team in tackles currently. He's got three passes defended and an interception. He's been flying all over the field. The Panthers are, have just pretty much said, hey, Jeremy Chin, line up here, line up there, do this, do that. He's been able to do virtually everything that they've asked of him, and he's done it at a high level. He's been great. So, man, I got to say, I love what Matt Rule's been doing, man. He's been doing some great things. And not to mention, Teddy Bridgewater has been playing pretty well this year. I still think Teddy Bridgewater is not a franchise quarterback, but I am definitely willing to change my mind if he potentially leads the Panthers to a, to the playoffs this year and maybe makes a deep playoff run. You know, I, I'm open to changing my mind about Teddy Bridgewater. I think Teddy Bridgewater is a starting quarterback. Don't know if he's a franchise quarterback yet, but he's playing pretty well. He's definitely taken upon, you know, the leadership role on this young Panthers team. He's playing some good football. And I got to say, man, Matt Rule and the Carolina Panthers are a team that definitely has a bright future. I love what I've seen from the Carolina Panthers, okay? Now, I will say, if Matt Rule could trade up for a guy like Justin Fields, I think he should do it because... As good as Tay Bridgewater's played this year, I don't anticipate him being the long-term answer. I think that if you can bring in a guy like Justin Fields to be on your roster and to sit behind Tay Bridgewater, it'd be a match made in heaven. Now you may not get to you may not get to Justin Fields, you know, because he's probably going to be a top five to top ten pick. And the Panthers, the way they're looking, they might win eight nine games potentially, you know. But I'm going to probably say. The Panthers win, eh, they'll win anywhere from six to eight games. I think this roster is still somewhat limited in a very loaded NFC. They still have to play some very good teams. They could prove me wrong, but if the Panthers can trade up for a franchise quarterback in this year's draft, they need to do it because they're they're a very good football team, and they may not have an opportunity to get a guy like Justin Fields potentially. Yeah, I don't think they're going to get Trevor Lawrence just because I don't think any team in the top three is going to want to trade down to pass on a guy like Trevor Lawrence. He's just that good. But if you can get a guy like Justin Fields, 
maybe a Kyle Trask or, or someone like that out of Florida. Maybe you're sold on Trey Lance. You should probably do it because the Panthers, they're getting pretty good very fast. And I got to say, I love what Matt Rule is doing. And eventually, I'm confident that Matt Rule will turn the Carolina Panthers into a Super Bowl caliber roster. He's that good of a head coach. Okay, let me talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers right here. The Pittsburgh Steelers are another team that I whiffed on big time this offseason. I, I whiffed on the Steelers big time. I felt they would go 8-8. Eight and eight. I didn't think Ben Roethlisberger would be a great quarterback anymore. I felt that him coming up a major surgery at age 38 years old was not ideal. I felt the offensive line was aging a little bit, may, may not be the same group this year. Didn't quite believe in the run, in the run game or the or the wide receiver core. I was totally wrong. I was totally wrong about the Pittsburgh Steelers. And you can make the argument that right now, the Pittsburgh Steelers are the best team in all football. They're that good. They're, I, I, that's, and that's saying a lot. Because Kansas City, Tampa Bay, they're pretty darn good. Green Bay, they're pretty darn good. Seattle, they're pretty darn good. Tennessee, they're pretty darn good. When I look at the Steelers team, I look at their head coach, Mike Tomlin. A-plus at head coach. Mike Tomlin, 14 years in, never had a losing season. He's a top three head coach. The offensive line, it's a B, it's a B plus to an A. It's a very experienced group that's hard-nosed and tough, and they play well. Ben Roethlisberger at quarterback. I'll say that at quarterback, the Steelers are about a B to a B plus just because there's so many good quarterbacks out there. But Ben Roethlisberger, he's still a top 10 quarterback as we speak today, in my opinion. As I speak today at the time of this episode, I believe Ben, ben Roethlisberger is still a top 10 quarterback. He's experienced. He's very smart. He makes good decisions. He's playing great football. 69% completion percentage, 11 touchdowns, one interception, a 109 pass rating through five games of the NFL season so far in 2020. Running back, the running back group, I'll give it a B just because they're top 10 in rushing, even though, even though I think James Conner is a little bit overrated. The wide receiver core, I'm going to give that A-. minus. I'll give their wide receiver core a minus just because I don't think they have a true number one, but Juju, he's pretty darn good. James Washington has some potential. Deontay Johnson, he's pretty good. And this guy, Chase Claypool, oh my God, have you seen this guy play? He's amazing. This guy's baby Calvin Johnson. He's the light-skinned Calvin Johnson potentially. I don't know if he'll ever reach Calvin Johnson's level, but he's got the six foot five frame. He runs, he runs very fast. He's great. Chase Claypool's a game changer, man. Eric Ebron is snagging touchdowns in the red zone. He's pretty good. And while I look at the defense, despite losing Devin Bush to injury, and that's a big blow to your defense because Devin Bush, he's a dynamic linebacker. I'll give the defense an A. Because I look at Minka Fitzpatrick, he's a dog. I look at TJ Watt, he's a dog. I look at Bud Dupree, he's a dog. Joe Hayton, he's still getting it done. The Steelers' defense is immaculate. It's great. The Steelers check off all the boxes, man. It's all going to come down to if Mike Tomlin and Ben Roethlisberger can be at their best come playoff time. Because we kind of seen, you know, Mike Tomlin and Big Ben have some stinkers as of late in the playoffs. You know, a couple years ago, a couple years ago, Ben Roethlisberger lost to Tim Tebow. You know, the last time he was in the playoffs, he lost to Blake Bortles. You know, he's got, he's got a playoff loss to Joe Flacco mixed in there. And while Joe Flacco does have a Super Bowl MVP, Joe Flacco is not the greatest quarterback. So, you know. Pittsburgh, I want to see how they play Tennessee just because it's going to be their biggest test so far to this point. But I got to say, man, the Steelers, they check a lot of boxes, and they're a legit Super Bowl caliber team, no doubt about it. So the New England Patriots are off to a slow start this year. Out the gate in 2020, they are a 2-3 and three ball club. They are trailing the Miami Dolphins at 3-3 three and three, and the Buffalo Bills at 4-2 and two at the time of this episode recording, okay? Now, the thing about the Patriots is they have a very good defense. The defense is still very good, led by Stephon Gilmore, a very good secondary. We know Bill Belichick is arguably the best defense of mine in the entire NFL in 2020 as we speak today. He's great. That defense is very, very sound. And I think the Patriots have a very good run game. Sonny Michelle is having a pretty solid season. He's not gotten a whole lot of carries. I think Sonny Michelle needs to get a couple more carries this year. But, you know, Sonny Michelle, Rex Burkhead, the run game is pretty good. The offensive line is still pretty solid. The only problem for the Patriots is they don't have a very talented wide receiver and tight end court. 
their wide receivers and tight ends are just not very good. And I like Julian Elman. I like Nikhil Harry. I like Damian Bird. But these guys are not explosive wide receivers. And, you know, there's all this talk about Cam Newton having to learn the whole new system this year. You know, and I understand there are some struggles with learning a whole new system with Cam Newton. You know, he's got he's kind of gotten off to a slow start because of lack of uh, lack of getting preseason games. This has not been the ideal offseason for Cam Newton. But guess what? If you have dudes at wide receiver, meaning if your wide receivers are super duper talented, the scheme only means so much. The scheme means everything with the Patriots right now because the players they have are just not very good at wide receiver. I'm sorry. Julian Elman looks washed. Nikhil Harry can't separate down the field consistently. And Damian Bird, he's a good player. But on certain teams, he'd be the fourth option. He's the second best option right now on this team. Okay? And right now, the Patriots offense is just very not – it's just not that good. Okay? It's not. And ultimately – the Patriots, if they're going to miss the playoffs this year, is going to be because Bill Belichick and this coaching staff have refused to address the wide receiver position. And by the way, the Patriots could have had Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell was on the market. He only cost you about $2 million, Bill Belichick. Why did you not go out and sign Le'Veon Bell? He'd be a great option out the backfield for Cam Newton. He'd be a great safety blanket for this offense. But the Patriots say, nope. We're rigid. We believe in our system, and it's going to work. No, it's not going to work. And the Patriots, ultimately, I don't think they're quite a Super Bowl caliber roster at the moment just because they don't have enough explosive weapons on the outside. And while they could upset a team like Kansas City or Pittsburgh, maybe, just because we know Cam Newton is great, we know Bill Belichick is great, and once the Patriots enter the tournament, anything's possible. But ultimately, I don't see any scenario in which the Patriots can go win three or four straight games to, to win a Super Bowl this year just because they're not explosive enough on the outside of wide receivers. They just don't have the weapons. And ultimately, shame on the Patriots organization. Shame on Bill Belichick and shame on the Patriots organization for not surrounding Cam Newton with better weapons on the outside. I kind of feel I kind of have even uh, even more profound respect for Tom Brady just because Tom Brady won 12 games last year with not great wide receiver play you know th th this is the same weapons that Tom Brady had last year and Cam Newton is struggling big time meanwhile Tom Brady goes out goes out there and wins 12 games Cam Newton on the year has you know two touchdown passes to four interceptions and an 81 pass rating you know he's been efficient at times but he's made some boneheaded mistakes and listen I understand that Cam Newton is dealing with the, with a whole new challenge this year, but I have to hold Cam Newton accountable because this guy's a former league MVP. This guy's been to a Super Bowl. I expect better from Cam Newton. While Cam Newton has been very good at running the football for the Patriots, as far as you know the things that he's been doing in the passing game, eh, he hasn't been cutting it. So again, the Patriots they play the four the play, they play the Forty Niners at home. You know, this upcoming week, okay? So we're going to really see what the Patriots are all about this time around. I do think the Patriots are better than their record as indicated at this point just because I firmly believe that if Cam Newton had played versus the Kansas City Chiefs, they'd probably win that game. And Cam Newton obviously couldn't practice for a good amount of time because of COVID-19. So obviously he was rusty versus the Broncos. So eventually, I do believe the Patriots will hit the ground running. And if I were to bet money on it, I'm going to say the Patriots do make the playoffs, but as of right now, that might be wishful thinking on my part because the Patriots, look, looking at the standings, right now Buffalo's better, right now the Dolphins are better. I'm just talking record-wise. You know, you could talk about the talent all you want, but record-wise, the Bills are better, the Dolphins are better, the Steelers are better, the Ravens are better, the Browns are better, the Colts are better, the Titans are better, the Chiefs are better, the Raiders are better. And the Broncos now on a tiebreaker over them. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's about eight or nine teams right off the bat right now that are that are in a better spot today than the Patriots. Not to mention the Patriots. You look at their schedule. Boy, is their schedule brutal down the stretch, okay? It's really, really brutal. I don't know if the Patriots can make the playoffs this year, you know, because – when I look at their schedule, they got to play the 49ers, who, who are who are getting healthier and healthier by the day. They still got to play Buffalo twice. They got to play the Ravens. They have to play the Cardinals. They have to play the Chargers. They have to play the Rams. They have to play at Miami. We know Miami gives them trouble every single year. So, man, the Patriots, I'm 
mentioned in the offseason, I won't be shocked that the Patriots miss the playoffs just because I don't believe in their offense. And this is the first time where there's going to be major change to the Patriots organization in regards to structure at the quarterback position because Tom Brady, he he was so, yo, all in when it came to football. He knew the playbook 24-7. And Bill Belichick knew Tom Brady inside and out. And the Patriots are struggling now that Tom Brady is gone. And by the way, shout out to Tom Brady for leaving Bill Belichick because Bill Belichick did not give him enough weapons. We see right now Cam Newton is on an island because he doesn't have enough support on offense. And Tom Brady, he's got weapons for days in Tampa. And right now, Tampa Bay, they like they look like the best team in all of football, potentially outside of maybe Kansas City or Pittsburgh at the moment. You know, those are probably the top three teams right now. But Tampa Bay easily could win the Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the Patriots, they might just be lucky to get into the playoffs this year. So, again, I'm not giving up on the Patriots. I will say if they lose to the 49ers, it's probably a done deal for the playoffs for them just because there's so many good AFC teams. I mean, even the Cleveland Browns, people, people you know, harp on Baker Mayfield and the Browns. The Browns have looked pretty good this year. So, again, we'll see if the Patriots make it into the playoffs. But ultimately, the Patriots, very limited, poor offense with lack of a deep threat at wide receiver is going to be the reason why they don't win a Super Bowl this year. And it could be the reason why they missed the playoffs in 2020. Shame on Bell checking the organization for not addressing the biggest needs when it's been obvious for the last couple of years. Okay, my final topic before I get to some baseball. I want to talk about the Saints. The Saints, to me, are no longer a contender for Super Bowl 55. They're just not. Drew Brees is no longer a great quarterback. He's a good quarterback, but not a great quarterback anymore. His arm strength, his arm strength has deteriorated. He can't move around like he used to. He doesn't like getting hit. No quarterback likes getting hit, but now Drew Brees being much older, he especially does not like to get hit. He can't fit the ball in the tight windows anymore. He's very physically limited, and Sean Payton knows it, and NFL defenses know it. And this team is too dependent on Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara. And we saw in the last two appearances in the playoffs for the Saints, in the Rams game and in the Vikings game, those team, those defensive coordinators realized it, and they exposed the New Orleans Saints. And looking at their schedule so far, based on some of the wins they've gotten, I'll give them a, I'll give them the win versus Tampa Bay. The Tampa Bay win was very good, even though Tom Brady was learning a whole new system, even though Tampa Bay, you know, wasn't quite in full sync as a team. I'll give the Saints credit for that win. But outside of that, I've got a loss to the Raiders, where they did not look good. I've got a loss to the Packers. I I got I got a game versus the Lions where the Saints were fortunate enough to win that game. That game was pretty close down the stretch. And the Chargers game, they should have lost that game. They got dominated for most of that game. The Chargers just turned into the, into the Chargers and handed the Saints the game. And I look at the NFC, I think Tampa's better. I think Green Bay's better. I think Seattle's better. I think Chicago's better. I think the Rams are better. I think the Cardinals right now are better. And once the 49ers get healthy, on paper, they're a better team than the Saints. So, listen, am I saying the Saints are going to miss the playoffs? Maybe, maybe not. Am I saying the Saints are a Super Bowl team? No way, no how. The Saints are complete frauds. Sure, they're a very talented team. Sure, they have a chance to win about 10 or 11 games, maybe. But come playoff time, they don't match up with the big boys. And ultimately, the fact that Drew Brees is no longer capable of playing at an elite level, <laughs> I just I just have to disqualify the Saints. And by the way, that defense is not good. The pass rush has been non-existent for most of the year. The secondary has been bad. The linebacker core has not played good. The Saints defense is arguably the most overrated defense in the entire NFL. I'm just saying, man. So, sorry, Saints fans. I've seen enough through about five, six games. Uh, what's your record? Uh, record is 3-2 and two right now, I believe, heading into the Panthers game. I actually won't be surprised if the Panthers find a way to beat the Saints just because they are banged up a little bit. They don't have Michael Thomas. They won't They won't have Emmanuel Sanders for the game. So the Saints very well could lose. They very well could win. We'll see. But I'm not buying the Saints. The Saints, to me, are not Super Bowl contenders. They will not win Super Bowl 55. And ultimately, I'm just not so – I'm really not. 
Okay, people, I'm going to shift to my World Series prediction. I actually dropped this episode a couple of days ago, right before the World Series officially got underway. But for those of you that listen on podcasting platforms, if you don't, if you're not subscribed to me on YouTube, which you should be, by the way, you did not get a chance to hear my thoughts on how I felt the World Series was going to play out. So you guys can listen to that, and then I'll close out the show. You guys can kind of hear how I thought, how I felt the World Series would play out. You could kind of, you know, see if what I said is true or false so far. And after that, we'll call it a day and we'll end the show. I'll be right back with that clip. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Juice Alert. If you have not subscribed to the Juice Alert already, be sure to do that right about now. You will not regret it. I want to talk some baseball at this moment. So we have we officially have our World Series matchup for 2020, Los Angeles Dodgers versus Tampa Bay Rays. These two teams are very, very good teams. Obviously, both have excellent pitching staffs. Both have very good solid lineups top to bottom. And recently, the Rays, they made the World Series by knocking off the Houston Astros 4-3 to three in the ALCS. And the Dodgers, they recently just knocked off the Atlanta Braves in the NLCS. So who's going to win this World Series match of the 2020 World Series? Who's going to win? In my opinion, I believe the Los Angeles Dodgers are going to defeat the Tampa Bay Rays in six games in the 2020 World Series. My preseason pick for the World Series was actually Yankees over Dodgers. The Yankees did disappoint me. The Tempe Rays, they pretty much, you know, said, that prediction needs to go out the window. We'll take care of the Yankees for you. And the Yankees disappointed. But the Dodgers, they're here in this big game. And I'm going to pick the Dodgers to win the World Series in six games, like I said, okay? In my opinion, the Dodgers are just a little bit more talented version of the Tampa Bay Rays. And I know the Tampa Bay Rays are a very good, solid team. They, they've they been very good wire to wire all season. But I'm gonna pick the Dodgers for I'm gonna pick the Dodgers to win the World Series for a couple of reasons. Momentum is clearly on the Los Angeles Dodgers side for this World Series matchup, heading into game number one, especially. If you've been following the MLB playoffs, you know that the Los Angeles Dodgers were down three games to one to the Atlanta Braves. But the Los Angeles Dodgers rallied off three straight victories. I'm convinced at this point that Atlanta sports are just cursed, whether it be the Falcons or the Braves, you know. Atlanta, Georgia football too. Georgia, you know, blew a national title game to the Alabama Crimson Tide a couple years ago. Georgia just got mollywhopped and destroyed by Alabama recently. Um, Not really destroyed, but Alabama dominated that game. But I'm convinced that Atlanta sports are cursed, like I said. But the Dodgers were down 3-1 to one in that Atlanta Braves series. And now, heading into this series, they're versus versus Tampa Bay, they're coming off three straight victories. They are a hot ball club right now. And I don't see the firepower that the Los Angeles Dodgers present to the table cooling off at any point during this series. I believe the Dodgers will win this series in six games. You know, if you look at the Rays, the Rays were lucky to squeak by the Houston Astros. The Houston Astros were down three games to nothing. And they forced a game number seven, and Tampa Bay barely squeaked by and won that series versus Houston. And I'm not saying Houston is a bad team. Houston's a very talented team, but they had not been the same Houston Astros of old over the past couple of years as Houston. They were a below 500 team in the regular season. And if you're the Tampa Bay Rays, you should have closed that series out a lot sooner than you did. And like I said, the Dodgers, they're coming in hot. I just believe the Dodgers have too much firepower for the Tampa Bay Rays, and that is going to be the undoing for the Rays in this series. You know, we saw the Los Angeles Dodgers in game number three versus Atlanta. At one point in that game, they scored 15 runs in three straight innings. That's crazy. 15 runs in three straight innings to start the game versus Atlanta in game number three. That shows you how much firepower the Los Angeles Dodgers have. And while Tampa Bay has an excellent pitching staff, a pretty solid bullpen. I don't think that pitching staff will be able to carry them in a seven-game series versus the Dodgers. Like, for example, in the ALDS or the wild-card round, 
You could see a very good ball club that's won a bunch of games in the regular season get knocked off simply because sometimes your bats get a little cold for about a two to three game stretch. But in a best of seven series, if you're going to beat the LA Dodgers four times, good luck. And as good as Tampa Bay is, I don't think they have the firepower to beat the Dodgers. I just don't. You know, I think the Dodgers are going to win this series. Obviously, Cody Bellinger is a stud. Now, Cody Bellinger is dealing with a little bit of a shoulder injury, so that is something to keep uh, keep your eye on during this series, but I believe that he'll be fine. Just his presence in the lineup, you know, definitely helps out the Dodgers. Mookie Betts, he's excellent. You know, he's a great player. You know, Turner, even A.J. Pollock, Corey Seager. I mean, the Dodgers, their lineup is just so stacked, man, and their starting pitching is pretty good as well. You know, and Clayton Kershaw, he's going to get the start in game number one on the mound for the Dodgers, and I believe that Clayton Kershaw is going to pitch one of his best, one of the best games of his career in game number one. I'm going to go on a limb. I'm going to trust Clayton Kershaw to come through this time around. We've seen Clayton Kershaw, you know, be great in the regular season, but sometimes shrink in the playoffs. In the past, I've called Clayton Kershaw the biggest choker in sports history just because we've seen him be an all-time great in the regular season consistently and in the postseason. He has not consistently been an all-time great. Some players, you know, elevate under pressure in the playoffs. Some players stay the same under pressure. And some players shrink under pressure. And Clayton Kershaw, we've seen this guy time and time again shrink under pressure in the playoffs. But I believe that Clayton Kershaw will right the ship, at least in game number one. And I believe the Los Angeles Dodgers will beat the Tampa Bay Rays in six games during the 2020 World Series for all the reasons that I mentioned. Okay, everyone, I thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I will be back with more great content for you guys. I appreciate all you that have tuned in to watch this episode. Have a God-blessed day. Stay safe, you guys. Stay motivated, and I'm out. Thank you so much for watching this video today. Please also note that the Juice Alert Sports Podcast is not just a YouTube channel. It is available on all podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this content with all your friends. This podcast is my favorite thing in the entire world right now. It is my passion. And I want more people to listen to this podcast. I really want this podcast to grow. Also, a fun fact about me is that I want to go into the sports broadcasting and media world once I graduate from the University of Toledo, a college in Northern Ohio. I am looking to become one of the next great sports broadcasters and analysts out in the world. And I potentially would like to start my own network if this podcast really truly grows. Or if I fall short of that goal, I would love to work for a big time network like ESPN or Fox Sports 1. I am open to all networks. So if you believe in my dreams and you see or hear my passion through the screen, be sure to tell all your friends about the Juice Alert Sports Podcast. Stay motivated, you guys. Have a God-blessed day, and I'm out.